Hey TC3, my name is Jack. And I'm Danny. We're your TC3 summer interns. And here's what's happening in this week's TC3 news. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram by searching TC3 Church to stay up to date and connected with everything going on here. You can also find us on YouTube. Our channel is youtube.com slash TC3 Church. You will find all of our services on demand there, as well as content and channels for our TC3 kids, students, and TC3 live worship ministries. Subscribe to those channels today. Did you know that you can follow along with our Sunday message on the YouVersion Bible app? To get started, just head to tc3.church slash message, or if you already have the YouVersion Bible app, you can find us in the app by tapping more, then events, and search for tc3.church. YouVersion exists to help you read, hear, and explore the Word of God, so download the app today. Our vacation Bible school is full. I mean, it is overflowing to the brim, kids all over the place, but that means we need more of you. Teenagers and adults, we need your help to serve in this year's Vacation Bible School Making Waves. That's right, it's gonna be happening June 20 to 24th. We have ample amount of space for you guys to sign up to be able to serve in our kids the message of Jesus Christ as we aim to make a splash of who Christ is in their life. So go to tc3.church slash kids and get yourself ready registered to serve this summer today. Hey TC3, this summer from July 18 to the 23rd, we are excited to be heading to Denver, Colorado to serve at the Denver Dream Center for our summer mission trip. Now, if you've been looking for an opportunity to serve, this trip is perfect for you. If you wanna be pushed outside of your comfort zone and see Jesus transform lives while impacting yours, this is for you. At the Dream Center, we'll be serving in a variety of ways, from neighborhood block parties, food pantries, street evangelism in downtown Denver. This trip has everything. Now, we don't want you to miss out on this incredible opportunity, so head to tc3.church slash Denver for more information and to get registered today. We are so excited to serve this community with all of you. And if you are a parent of a sixth through 12th grader, we are really excited to do life with your teens throughout this summer. We are really looking forward to heading to camp with students this summer. With that being said, the deadline to sign up for camp is coming up. Yeah, the deadline to sign up for the Passion Summer Camp is coming quickly. Thursday, June 2nd is the last day to sign up for summer camp. Don't wait any longer. Head to tc3.church slash passion22 to pay your $50 deposit. If you need financial assistance, get your $50 deposit in and then email Pastor Miles at miles at tc3.church. We do not want anything to hold you back from the most amazing week of your summer. Hey parents, we have the best week ever for your kids this summer. It's the Wind Shape Summer Camp. It's gonna be happening July 25th to July 29th. This is an epic, all out, energy filled, passionate, Christ led camp that your kids are absolutely gonna love. There's gonna be all sorts of activities from cooking to archery to football to gymnastics. Everything's gonna be in it. If you want your kids to be registered, go to tc3.church slash kids. Now we do have some scholarship money for families that are in need of it. But make sure that you get your kids registered today. tc3.church slash kids. Win, shape, summer camp. It's the best, I promise. Here at TC3, we're all about connecting people to the life-changing power of Jesus Christ. And we hope that in today's experience, you connect with Jesus in a real way. Well, good morning, church. How's everybody doing? I invite you guys to stand up with us if you're in house, you're out on the lawn, you're watching online. God bless. Thanks for tuning in. Here we go. My song will be you. That's right. I'm living in freedom. You've taken my burdens away. Jesus forever. My song will be only for you. Yeah. For the cross that you bore. In the death that you paid For the victory you won over death and the grave 
This is the reason I sing For the hope that you give And the joy that you bring For the promise that heaven is waiting for me And this is the reason I sing Yeah, I know Welcome to church, everybody. How's everybody feeling today? Sunday fun day. Let's do this. So welcome, everybody. If you're watching us online, if you're in the house, of course, if you are outside, welcome to church. And if you're a guest, checking us out, seeing what we're all about, thank you for being here and driving by the building or having somebody say, hey, come check this place out. We hope that you'll call this place TC3 home. And we're going to have our ushers that are kind of standing by, our section leaders that are going to come down that aisle, and they have some information cards. If you don't mind just kind of waving at them or gesturing at them, grab one of those cards, fill it out, and when you're done filling that out, drop it off at the information desk, because most of all, we want to know, hey, how can we be praying for you? How can we be praying for you and letting you know all the opportunities we have coming up here at church? Because that is the key word today. It's opportunity. You know the faith is more about Sundays, right? It's, it's not just about Sundays. It's about getting involved in the life of this church. And there are so many opportunities in front of us to serve. And if you're a 6th grader through 12th grader in here, or if you're a parent of one, please definitely consider the Passion Camp you saw advertised here behind us. That's going on July 11th through the 15th. What an opportunity to grow and expand your faith. And signups are coming up soon. June 2nd, you have to sign up by. So please find Pastor Miles. I see him back there. There's Pastor Miles. And you can also go to our website as well, tc3.church. And parents, how many of you are excited for VBS coming up soon? What a day. Hey, this VBS, TC3's VBS, 
is where it's at in our community. We have well over 200 plus kiddos in this place. So what does that need? Help. Please help us, all right? Please volunteer to serve. If you're a teenager, if you're an adult, a great opportunity. That is going to be June the 20th through the 24th. And you can register at tc3.church slash kids to sign up to register to help in that event. Anybody pick up a baby bottle last week too at the information desk? Keep filling up those baby bottles with spare change and you can drop them off by Father's Day in a month or so. Remember, all that change, all that money is going towards the CareNet Crisis Pregnancy Center, helping out our women in need in this community. Lots of opportunities to serve. So we're going to move now to a time of worship. And you know, this time of worship is with our tithes and our offerings and our, and our giving. This is our opportunity to say, God, hey, we trust you. We trust you with this. We know it's going to go to all these ministries and making God's kingdom expand that much farther. So you can participate by texting the number 77977 in the text box. Put TC3 in the amount you want to give. You can also use PushPay. You can, if the QR code jumps up there, you can scan the QR code or you can uh, access PushPay in the app section of your phone and make it automatic. Will you pray with me this morning, please? Lord Jesus, we continually invite you into our hearts. We invite you into this worship. We invite you into this message, Lord. We know there are people who need to hear this message here today. Lord Jesus, this offering is for you. We give this to you. This is yours. And we know you're going to do immeasurable things with it. We invite you in. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Would you all stand as we continue in our worship today?
You believe that truth, church? Come on, we're going to sing about his hope, the promise of his love and his goodness. Come on. Come on, you know it. And days may be darkest, but your light is greater. You light our way, God, you light our way, Jesus. When evil is rising, you're rising higher with power to save, with power to save. All right, come on! Because you keep hope alive. You keep hope alive from the beginning to end. Your word never... Come on! Because you are alive. Jesus, you are alive. strong home but your life was stronger So I will 
How is everybody? Good. 
That's a pretty, pretty good response. Hey, I'm Joel, um, and I am filling in for Pastor Gordon as he's been on break for a few weeks here. So um, if you're like, who is that guy up there? I've been here for the last few weeks, and I'll be here also next week. We're going to be do- continuing this series called Free Your Father. It's based on a book that I'm, I'm wrapping up right now, writing, where we're talking about this ancient idea that for you to achieve your destiny at some point, you have to find freedom and then come to grips with what your parents, those who came before you weren't, and what they were. And then there's this idea, this ancient idea that you have to go and rescue your father or your mother from the clutches of the dark side. We think about Luke Skywalker having to go rescue Darth Vader, his father, from the dark side, or Pinocchio going to the belly of the whale. And it's an ancient idea that we also see in the Bible. So I'm not going to unpack all of it. Uh, if, you, if, if this is intriguing to you, what we talk about today, I would encourage you to go back and check out the previous messages from the last two weeks. Um, I want to talk specific this morning, I want to let you guys know something I forgot to mention last week. Uh, we talked last week about forgiveness, the importance of forgiveness. And there's a version on the Bible app, if you ever use that. There's a version devotional that I wrote called The Power to Forgive. It's a short five-day devotional. And if you want to if you have somebody who's like, man, they really need to get over some, some issues or whatever, you could refer them to this. It's a kind of a, an entry-level um, Bible devotional on how to, how to forgive, and that's available on the YouVersion Bible app. The other thing I forgot to mention is I send out every Monday a super short, encouraging email, and it's just a little, it's super short, like 500 words. And if you want to get subscribed to that list, that email list, I won't be spamming you or anything. You can sub- just... Uh, Text my name, Joel, that's the message, to that phone number, 4414. Follow the prompts there and you'll be subscribed to that. So, we're going to continue the series uh, today. I heard a story about a guy who had a pet pig. And this pig kept wandering into his neighbor's yard. And the neighbor would get mad and he'd be like, get your pig out of my yard, it's eating my flowers. Well, one day the guy's pig disappeared for several days and he came over to his neighbor's house. He's like, hey, have you, have you seen my my pet pig. And the guy goes, yeah, I've seen, I've seen your pig. It wandered into my yard one too many times and I killed it and we're going to make bacon out of it. And the guy's like, oh man, sir, please just give me the, can you give me the pig back? It was a family pet. We want to give it a proper burial. And the guy's like, no, that pig got in my yard. It's my pig. So the owner of the pig said, look, I'll make a deal with you. I'm going to go and get a baseball bat and let's take turns whacking each other in the stomach with a baseball bat. And whoever gives in first the other person will get the pig. And the guy that shot the pig's like, sounds good to me, let's do it. So the guy goes and gets a bat and he's like, all right, all, the owner goes, I'll go first. And so the guy's like, all right. So he hardens himself, tightens up his stomach, his abs as much as he can. The guy who owned the pig takes the bat and goes, whack, hits the guy so hard. And the guy falls on the ground. He's just coughing, coughing up blood and just like, ah, you know, takes him three or four minutes to recuperate. And finally he gets back up. He's like, Whew. All right, my turn. My guy is like, ah, you can keep the pig. <laughs> that joke has nothing to do with what we're talking about today, but you ever have one of those experiences where you're just like, I wish I could just get a baseball bat? And anyway. So when I was a kid, I was about seven years old. We were living in South Texas, and my dad and mom felt like God was calling us to move to central Texas, to the hills, to this small town, and start a missions ministry center on 18 acres of land that a guy had bought. And they were going to start a church out there and a missions, a, a center for missionaries. And uh, I, was, I was super, you know, I didn't know any, any better. Like, I was like, oh, cool, okay. Well, we, we ended up moving to this small town. And it became an absolutely horrible experience for me as a seven-year-old. It was miserable. The worst part was we were starting a church in the middle of nowhere. So our family was dirt poor. On top of that, we were in, the guy who had the brilliant idea to start this thing and got my dad and mom recruited for it, he bought 18 acres of land that he hadn't, they took out a loan for. So every month they were just struggling to make these payments and it was so hard on our family financially. Uh, I'll never forget that when I would go through the lunch line at school. We got government assisted lunch. So lunch was free for us. And I was so embarrassed by that. Uh, I would always go through the line last so that my friends, the cool kids, wouldn't know that I got free lunch because we were so poor. 
And, uh, we, you know, I never had the cool shoes. My mom, you know, all, everybody wanted Air Jordans, and all these kids were getting Air Jordans, and my mom one day, she went out and bought me Nikes, and she brought them to me, and I'm like, Mom, these aren't Nike Airs. They have to be Nike Airs, or I'm not cool, and I was so embarrassed to wear these shoes, and it, there was just so much humiliation with the poverty of it, and, and we were poor, and I was embarrassed to say what we did, that we, we had a church out in the middle of the country, did not like the experience, and then things got worse. When I was 11, my dad announced, hey, we're going to ruin your life. That's not what I actually, he actually said, but uh, he called our family into the room and said, we feel God is calling us to be missionaries in Central America, in this war-torn country in Central America, and, uh, and we're going we're gonna to move down there. And we're, so we, we traveled around the country visiting churches and started raising support, and we would ask for money to be missionaries. And I hated this. It was so embarrassing to me. I'm like, why do we got to be asking people for money? And dad's like, people support us. And we go in. And I remember having this distinct thought thinking, first of all, I'm never going to be a pastor like my dad. Never. Do not ask me to be standing up in front of people at a church and talking to them. Don't ask me to do it. I'm never going to do that. And then when we became missionaries, I actually enjoyed living in Guatemala. But I remember leaving and thinking, you know what? I'm never going to be a missionary. I'm going to get a real job. I'm gonna, I don't want to have to ask people and beg for money. Well, I went to the U.S. and got a college degree, worked my way through college. And in my senior year of college, while I was climbing a mountain in Russia, I felt like God said that I was supposed to become a missionary and raise support. And I was like, no, no, no. I'm my own man. I'm not going to do that. You know, I, always, I would love this line that my mentor would say. He's like, a, a large oak never grows in the shadow of another large oak. So you have to go out and become your own large oak, right? I thought, I'm never going to be a missionary. Well, we became missionaries. Then we moved to, when we moved to Peru, we felt like God was calling us to start a church. And I was like, no, no, I vowed to never do this. I'm never going to start a church. That was my dad's journey, not mine. Then we felt like we had to raise money for it. And so uh, one day I woke up and I go, oh my gosh, I'm becoming everything I said I would never be. I'm becoming my father. And my father was a good father, right? But then the nail in the coffin was last year when right in the middle of the pandemic, we felt like God was telling us to buy some land in the same town where my miserable youth was spent and start a missions ministry center I was like oh my gosh I am doomed to be my father it's happening the worst part was I'll never forget when we were signing on it 16 acres just a few miles from where I had that miserable experience growing up and I thought I'm coming back to the same place I vowed to like kick the dust off the feet off my feet from and here I am doing it again and I've talked to so many people in life and I know that everyone in this room there's some way and somewhere in your life where you looked at the journey your parents took growing up and maybe you just completely rejected it you're like I am never you know I got dragged along on that adventure and I did not want that adventure maybe it was the challenges of growing up poor maybe it was the the challenges of growing up with a, a, a father who was, got transferred all over the country or all over the world all the time you're like I'm never gonna do that I'm gonna find one place I'm gonna park myself there and I'm never gonna move Many of us, we reject everything our parents were for one reason or another. Some, on the other extreme, they feel so pressured into be taking on maybe the family business or carrying on the family lineage, and they take it on. I talked to a guy the other day. He said, man, I hate being a lawyer, but I knew that's what my dad wanted for me because we're a family of lawyers. So I went to law school, and that's all he would pay for anyway. So I went to law school. I'm a lawyer, but I hate my life. He says, I just want to break free from that. At some point, we all have this moment where we go, I just want to become my own person. I want to do my own thing. And sometimes we feel the weight of obligations to carry on something our parents started. Or sometimes we feel the weight of becoming everything our parents weren't. But I have a proposal for you this morning. I want to throw out a question to you. What if your family and your upbringing prepared you with a message and a mission? If we really believe that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which the Father prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. If we really believe that all things work together for the good of those who love Him and those who are called according to His purpose, I believe that the journey that you got dragged along on with your parents 
There's something you learned through that that has prepared you for your specific calling and mission on this earth. The good part of what you got from your parents and the bad part of what you got from your upbringing and your parents. So we're going to talk this morning about this mission that God has placed in your life because you aren't here by accident. You weren't placed in the family you were placed in by accident. And you say, well, my, my family, they were horrible. Maybe they were, but listen, I really believe that even in the midst of that, God had a plan and he was preparing you with a mission and a message that you have to share with the world. There's a guy we're all familiar with, the story of Abraham. We know the story of Abraham. He left his home and he traveled down. He fa- traveled down to Canaan and he became the founder of the nation of Israel. But what's interesting about Abraham is if you read the chapter right before his story, you find that his father also went on an adventure. You pick up in Genesis, it says, Terah, this was Abraham's father, took Abram, this was before God changed Abram's name to Abraham, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarah, his daughter-in-law, his son Abraham's wife. And they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans, that's the area of Babylon, to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, it's about halfway, if you look at a map, they started in Ur, they went, they were supposed to go here, they stopped right about here. When they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years and Terah died in Haran. He set out on a journey, but he never got there. And some, there's lots of conjecture. Why would he stop short in Haran? Some say that it had to do with the fact that he had a son named Haran. And maybe when he got to this town called Haran, this, but his son had died earlier, maybe when he got to Haran, he's like, man, just, you know what? We're just going to camp out here because the pain of having lost my son is too much. We don't know why he never completed the journey. But we see in the next chapter that God goes and calls Abram. It says, now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This story is fascinating to me because I meet a lot of people who they feel like they're limited or set back or set at a disadvantage because of the journey their father took, the journey their mother took. And they feel like they didn't get some of the advantages they have. And what's fascinating is Abraham should have grown up in Canaan. He should have grown up in the promised land. But he didn't. He grew up in a foreign land, far short of what God had intended for his father, Terah. Abraham could have been bitter and resentful. But later in his life, God called Abraham to complete the journey his father never finished. And Abraham got the blessing. And I think that's a message for all of us, that you may feel disadvantaged, set back because of the journey your father took or the journey or your mother failed to complete, but it doesn't mean that you're destined to stay in that place. God has greater things for you. He has a promised land for you, but you're going to have to take on the journey of completing the journey of your father. And I believe that you're already prepared to complete that journey. There's this thing in psychology we call repetition compulsion. It's the tendency to repeat familiar patterns of thought or response. You know, in your life, you're not, there's a lot of stuff you're not necessarily taught. You just kind of catch it. They say more is caught than taught. There's ways you learned of relating to the world, of dealing with all sorts of things in your life, from money to relationships to conflict, that you learned observing your parents growing up. And sometimes we think it's the only way to deal with it, Relation, these things, relationships or finances, until you see another way and you go, whoa, that's different. Like, that's not how my parents dealt with things. And we, we come to this, but, but there's this tendency within us because of repetition compulsion to repeat the same mistakes that our parents did. In fact, you've probably had a moment where you're going, oh my gosh, I'm becoming my father. Oh no, I'm becoming my mother. That's the way she would treat us when this would happen. That's how she'd respond when things would happen. This repetition compulsion, it's a very real thing. In fact, it's so real, God even talks about it. In fact, he says this in Exodus. He says, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping his steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. And this next line This is one of these verses we don't put on Hallmark cards. Uh, 
it says visiting the iniquity, or it says the sin in some translations, of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generations. That's repetition compulsion. You say, well, that's a horrible thing. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't God, why would God do that? Well, I, I, don't, I don't know why it is, but I, 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 it's there. The reality is we are very prone to repeat the same mistakes of those who came before us if we aren't aware of them. But when we become aware of them, this is the important thing. You may have a propensity towards a certain thing. Alcoholism may run in your family. Avoidance may run in your family. Anger may run in your family. Just because you have the propensity to it, it doesn't mean you have to participate in it. You can be the one who breaks this curse in your family. But it takes recognizing it and it takes choosing a different path. Because we're all prone to repeat what we were caught rather than what was taught. And this is the really important thing. There are things that you've caught you didn't even realize you caught that are influencing the way you see the world. There's a lady named Ruby K. Payne. She's a friend of mine. She's brilliant. She wrote a book called A Framework for Understanding Poverty. And she says that, that what happens is we get a certain framework for seeing the world based on the socioeconomic class we grew up in. And she breaks it down into three classes, but there's several different ones. Generally, there's the poverty class, there's the middle, the middle class, and then there's the wealth class. And she says, you learn ways of relating to the world based on the class you grew up in that you don't even realize is the way you saw them. And you only realize that there's a different way of seeing it when you come in conflict with someone. In particular, this happens in marriage. If you grew up in poverty and you marry somebody that was, grew up in wealth, you're going to have all sorts of conflicts over ridiculous things. You're like, why are we arguing about this? Everybody knows this is the way it is, but you don't realize that you caught this mindset that you didn't even know. So she talks about, for example, simple things like money. In poverty, it's, used to be, it's made to be spent. In money, when you've got money, you spend it to alleviate the discomfort of your poverty. I had a lady tell me, she came up to me and she's like, this explains why I'm constantly broke. She said, my husband and I together, we make over $200,000 a year, but we live paycheck to paycheck. She said, when you were talking about this, I realized my father, he would make good money, but it, 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 on Friday, we'd go out to a theme park and we'd spend Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at the theme park. We'd all get the big drinks. We'd get the hot dogs. And he's like, and then Monday, we'd come home and our electricity would be shut off because my father used all that money to give us joy and alleviate the, the pain of the poverty, but now I'm living that way still. She said, I'll go binge spend $2,000 on clothes in a weekend and we're living paycheck to paycheck, but we shouldn't be. But it's because she didn't realize there was a different way of dealing with money. Money was always used to alleviate discomfort. In the middle class, it's about managing your money. You gotta manage that money and increase the money, make a little bit more. And in the wealth, it's about sustaining the money that your family gave to you. So that money is made to be invested and it's all about your portfolio, your investment portfolio. And you and your spouse may have a lot of arguments about money that may come down to the way you caught things. And listen, this chart, she has like 25 things. I highly recommend the book, Crossing the Tracks for Love is one of her books where she talks about that. She talks about all sorts of different ways, even the way we look at food. In, the, in poverty, food is about quantity. Did you get enough? Did you get enough food? In the middle class, it's about quality. How, was it, how did it taste? And in wealth, it's about presentation, which is why you'll go to that restaurant that's $75 a plate and they give you this giant white plate and a tiny piece of beef and a little parsley. And you're like, that's great, but I'm still hungry. But in wealth, it doesn't matter how much it costs because there's always more money. In poverty, it's all about relationships with people because relationships are all you got. So that's why you keep bailing out your cousin and who keeps getting thrown in jail because you may get thrown in jail one day and you aren't going to have the money to pay for it. Your cousin's got to bail you out. And you have, may have a family member that's constantly bailing family, family out. And you're going, why are you constantly bailing them out? Because maybe you grew up in the middle or wealth class and you're constantly fighting about it. But they're saying, no, family's first, man. We do whatever it takes for family, even if they came, keep making the same mistakes over and over again. There's all these ways we see the world that we're caught rather than taught. She talks about time. It, the present is the most important. Live for today, because man, we're poor. We may not make it till tomorrow. So their decisions are made based on current need. In the, in the middle class, future is most important. Decisions made against future ramifications. You're trying to figure out how to get that retirement account padded. And in wealth, it's tradition and history are most important. Decisions are made based on tradition and decorum. Now here, here's my point with all of this. 
Some of you are going, oh my gosh, this explains everything going on in our marriage, right? This was a challenge for Emily and me because I, I grew up pretty poor, but, but she grew up, she doesn't think she grew up wealthy, but anytime you grow up on a golf course in a country club, you're wealthy in my mind. Anyway, she's like, I didn't grow up wealthy. I'm like, yeah, no, you did, sweetheart. Anyway, <laughs> my point with this is, is there are things driving you, there are perspectives you have on the world, there are ways you have of seeing things that you don't even realize are influencing your view of the world. And I believe that not only the good is to your benefit, but I also believe the negative sides of the way of the journey that you were on, you were forced to take with your parents, have prepared you with a specific message and a mission for the world. Maybe the, the way you grew up in wealth, you understand how the wealthy think. Like one of the things I learned with the wealthy is you never go up and introduce yourself to another wealthy person. You have to wait for someone to introduce you to a wealthy person. As I, I broke all sorts of rules of decorum. I got invited to this cocktail party one time and my buddy called me over. He's like, bro, you don't just go up and shake people's hands. I got to introduce you. And you introduce them by their last name. This is Joel of the Malm family. You've never heard of them because they're nobody. But that's the way you do it. There's all these ways, that things that you learn that you don't even realize you've learned. And I believe the, the good side of it and the bad side of it is something God wants to leverage, wants you to leverage for the mission that he has prepared you for. Maybe one of the things in that chart is humor. Maybe God gave you a great sense of humor and you wouldn't have had that growing up in any other way than the way you grew up. You've learned to laugh at it. Maybe that humor is a gift that God has given you that we need in this world. Maybe you grew up in wealth and you're like, I don't really want to be in that world. Well, maybe you're called to be a a liaison between the wealthy and those who are in poverty to come together and help assist those in poverty, learn new ways of thinking. There's all sorts of ways, not just socioeconomically, but in every way that you grew up, that God has prepared you for a very specific message. There's a gift within you that you don't even realize is there because it's so natural to you because you caught it. It was never taught to you. Paul says this to Timothy, 2 Timothy 1. He says, he says, Timothy, I want you for this reason, I remind you to fan into the flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. He says, when you were hanging out with me, the laying on of hands, when you were rubbing shoulders with me, you caught some things from me and that gift is within you. And I want you to leverage that gift for God's glory. And when you leverage that gift for God's glory, you get fulfillment and joy. And there are things that you learned growing up that you didn't even realize you learned. Maybe it's the importance of relationships. Example, in poverty, relationships are the most important thing. You always got somebody that's got your back, but in wealth, you use money to buy your way out of things. I have certain family members that if I were to ask them to take me to the airport, they'd be like, let me just pay for your Uber. They'll use money to buy their way out of the things. And in relationship, in, in poverty, you go, no, relationships are the most important thing. And maybe the relational element that you grew up in, the importance of that, is the gift that you have to offer the world. There's something God gave you, and I want to encourage you to use that gift that he placed within you. Because you, you learn something you didn't even learn. And, and listen, this is super important. You can learn something from everyone. Sometimes the best thing you learn is what not to do. My father-in-law grew up without a father. I mean, his father was alive, but he wasn't present. He ditched the family. And I've never met someone who is as outstanding of a mentor to the fatherless as my father-in-law is. He takes people under his wing when they're in college, and he will mentor them, and he'll guide them. He'll teach them about finances, stuff he had to learn, you know, a lot of it on his own. But he realized his mission was to complete the journey that his father was never able to complete. He's going to become the father his father never was. And it all happened because he learned something from his father and it was what not to do. And sometimes the best thing you'll learn is what not to do. But my encouragement to you today is this. Don't despise your upbringing. I want you to start looking at it as God's divine provision in preparation for the mission and the message that he has given you because you have a call on this earth to complete something and the journey your father never completed your journey your mother never completed there's a very good chance that the thing you're running from is the very thing God is calling you to step in fill in the gap and become what your parents never could be complete the journey 
There's Hebrews 11 talks about the heroes of the faith. It's a whole list of guys. It says, by faith, Noah did this. By faith, Abraham did this. But at the end of Hebrews 11, there's this fascinating thing. It says this. Now, all these guys I just told you about, it says these were all commended for their faith. But none of them received what had been promised since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Through you, God is calling you to complete the journey of your family line, to be what your father and mother never could be. You're called to be that and to take your family to the next level, which is what we're going to talk about next week, how to pass the blessing on to your children. And then we pick up chapter 12. Now, in the Hebrew writing of this, there was no Hebrews 11. Hebrew, Paul didn't write it as Hebrews 11 or Hebrews 12. We assume Paul wrote Hebrews. He, it was just straight line, but we put a stop there. We put Hebrews 12, but Hebrews 12 is connected to Hebrews 11. He says, so that what was done could be completed to us and says, therefore now, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, all those family members that came before us, the people that never completed the journey, they never, you know, did everything that, that maybe that God had called for them. Maybe you felt set back at a disadvantage because of, them, because of them. Listen, it says you build off of that. You stand on the shoulders of those giants. He says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us throw off this mindset that I've been a victim. Man, if my father would have just done more, if he wouldn't have been so bad with money or if, I would, if he wouldn't have been an alcoholic, throw off that, hin that thing that's hindering you. And it says, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. You have a specific mission and calling. And then it says the way you're going to do it is by fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author, the pioneer, the perfecter of the faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God and consider him who endured such opposition from sinners that you won't grow weary and lose heart. You may have felt like this whole life of yours has been opposition after opposition, an uphill battle. But let me tell you this, you have a mission. Keep pushing forward. You have a calling on your life. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, your perfect father. And you will find that everything that you've walked through, the good, the bad, and the ugly, was preparation for the mission he gave you. You guys receive that? Let me pray for you. <laughs> father, we thank you so much that you, we are your workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which you prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I thank you, Lord, that the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter and brighter. You who began a good work in us will be faithful to bring it to completion. So I thank you, Lord, for everyone in this room, Lord. I know a lot of them came from rough backgrounds, poverty, abuse, whatever it is, Lord, that they came from. I pray that you would just help them get a new perspective. I, hope that, I pray that they begin to, to see that you were walking with them. Even in the challenging times, you were preparing them for their mission, the calling, that gift of God that you placed in them. And I thank you, Lord, they're going to leverage that and use that for your glory. And as they use that for your glory, they're going to find a sense of meaning and purpose. And they're going to begin to see, ah, that's why I had to learn that. Thank you, God, for the family you placed me in. Amen. Amen. Would you all stand? We're going to continue in our worship.
Amen. Amen, guys. We are so glad you're able to join us this morning. Don't forget there will be people underneath both of these screens ready and willing to pray for you. And when you hit those doors, that is where the mission field begins. Have a good week, guys.